Uh, let's start with prayer because we're continuing our study. What book are we studying? The book of Matthew. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I ask that you'll be with us this morning. You've already been with us in the singing, in the offering. Uh, it's been great. The children's story, what a great story about that horse, even a horse that knew about Sabbath. And Father, now as we spend a few moments and turn our attention to the text of Scripture, may you turn your attention to us by the Spirit. May we leave here with a better understanding, not just of Scripture, not just of the Bible, but more importantly, may we leave here with a better understanding of who you are. May we know your heart and know what you're all about. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. All right, let's open our Bibles to the book of Matthew. Does anybody know what chapter we're in? Okay, very good. Matthew chapter 12. So join me there if you would. Our sermon today is titled, The Rest of the Story, Matthew chapter 12. Let's go there together. In the 12th chapter of Matthew, we find that Matthew's gospel is gaining a kind of momentum. It's picking up speed, right? It's not that it started slow, but it is certainly, there's a rapidity to it now. There's a, there's a sequence, there's a feel that things are picking up, that Jesus is gaining in popularity, but as Jesus grows and gains in popularity, particularly with those who were on the fringes of first century Judaism, right, the Gentiles and the lepers and the tax collectors and the, those that were outside of the in crowd, as we talked about last week, the in crowd became the out crowd and the out crowd became the in crowd. As the Gospel of Matthew is picking up momentum, we get this sense that Jesus is on a collision course with the religious leaders of his day. And that is exactly what takes place in Matthew chapter 12. Here we find, up to this point in Matthew's gospel, the most decisive conflict and the most in-depth conflict that Jesus will have up to this point. It's going to be a significant conflict and hostility and disagreement between Jesus and the religious leaders of his day, particularly a group of people that were called the Pharisees. What were they called, everyone? The Pharisees, the Pharisees were the religious elite of Jesus' day. They were not the Sadducean aristocracy that were sort of the puppet rulers of Rome. The Pharisees were the religious conservatives. They were the ones who knew the Bible. They were the ones who knew Scripture. And Jesus is this provocative, young upstart. He's this, he's this cutting-edge new rabbi, and people are being drawn to him. People are being attracted to him. Again, not all the right people. Some of the wrong people were being attracted. Wrong people, I use in quotations, are being attracted to Jesus. And as his popularity increased, he was becoming, quite obviously, a threat to the religious establishment. Conflict was bound to happen as Matthew's gospel picks up this momentum. We anticipate, we expect a conflict and in Matthew chapter 12, we encounter that conflict head on. And so our presentation today is titled, The Rest of the Story. Now, if you just look at Matthew chapter 12, you'll notice that there's a lot of verses there. How many verses are in that chapter? 50 verses. This is going to be a difficult one because it's a, a lengthy chapter. This leaves me basically with two choices. Because it covers such an expanse of material, I can say a little about a lot, or I can say a lot about a little. Or some of you might think, well, David, if we know you at, well at all, you're going to say a lot about a lot, okay? So today I'm going to try to be disciplined, and I'm going to try to say a lot about a little bit, and then we'll just summarize the, the second part of the chapter. We're going to spend most of our time in the first uh, 15 to 20 verses of Matthew chapter 12. Now, before we get right into Matthew chapter 12, let's remind ourselves of where we've come from. Notice the last three verses of Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. This is how we closed our sermon last Sabbath. And Jesus gives these well-known, perhaps the best-known verses in the whole Gospel of Matthew. Right? The best-known verses, arguably, in the entire Gospel of Matthew are these verses which Jesus speaks with sympathy. He speaks with passion. He speaks with conviction and kindness. And he says, Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And what are the next words there? And I will... Give you rest. Come to me. What an invitation. Jesus at this point is in his late 20s, early 30s. This is, a, this is an audacious invitation, and it is pregnant with meaning for a first century Jewish audience, and so we're going to see that in just a moment. Think of the audacity of a, by, by his standards and by the contemporary standards. He was a young rabbi. He was unmarried. He wasn't part of the in crowd. He wasn't part of the religious elite, and he has the temerity to say, 
Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I, not I will introduce you to rest, not I will show you rest, not I will teach you how to rest, but I will give you rest. It is mine to give. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest, not just for your bodies. You will find rest for what? What does it say? For your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew chapter 11 ends with this hugely provocative, hugely audacious invitation of Jesus. Come to me because I can give you rest as a gift. Not just bodily rest, not just physical rest. I can give you rest for your, what was it everyone? I can give you rest for your souls. And if, if you had been alive in the days of Jesus and you had been somebody who was either a Pharisee yourself or sympathetic to the Pharisees, you might have thought to yourself, who does this guy think he is? How does he have the, the audacity to say that he can offer to us restfulness for our souls? As we continue our series through Matthew's gospel, we find ourselves here coming to the end of our fourth chapter. We've been through Jesus' son, Jesus' preacher, Jesus' healer. Those are the first nine chapters. And then now Jesus' leader. And in these chapters that I've taken over the last three Sabbaths, we have seen Jesus sending, we have seen him encouraging, we have seen him empowering, we have seen him correcting, we have seen him instructing. And today in Matthew chapter 12, we're even going to see Jesus defending. This is Jesus as a leader empowering and sending out his disciples, the 12 disciples, and then the outer circle that was even outside of them. Okay? Then next week, we'll pick up Matthew chapter 13. We'll get into our fifth chapter, which is Jesus as teacher, which will take us right through to chapter 20. Something that we've noted several times already in our series is that Matthew is presenting Jesus as the new Moses. And I'm not going to recapitulate that information here. That, that there is good textual evidence and good textual reason to believe that Matthew is presenting Jesus as a new Moses, as a new deliverer who is leading God's people out of exile. Here's a remarkable point, though, about Israelite history. Check this out. Moses brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. That's a story that would be known to all of us here, and, and people outside of even Christian circles would know the story of the Red Sea. Right, the parting of the Red Sea and the exodus from Egypt. But a fascinating thing happens. Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt into the wilderness. But when Moses got right to the borders, right to the edge, to the boundary of the promised land, Moses couldn't take them in. Moses was not able to take them into the promised land, but he could get them to the borders of the promised land. Moses put the baton into the hand of a man named Joshua... And Joshua then led the children of Israel in to the promised land. This is a key point. There's almost a little symbolism here, a significant amount of it, in fact, because, because Moses, as a symbol of the law, check this out, could not get God's people into the promised land. Moses could get them to the borders of the promised land, but then Moses places the baton into the hand of Joshua, Yeshua, and Joshua leads them into the promised land. But Jesus is presented here by Matthew not just as a Moses figure, but he's also presented as a Joshua figure. Why do I say that? Look at this here on the screen. Jesus is not only the new Moses. According to Matthew, he is the new Joshua bringing rest to the world. Incidentally, the name Joshua and Jesus are the same name. It's the Hebrew Yeshua. Right? Jesus' name was Joshua. And he's not just Joshua in name. I want to show you that he was Joshua in terms of the fulfillment of his mission. One of the great promises that the, that the Jews held to and that they clung to, especially the early Jews, going back to the time of Moses, was the idea that they would have their own land. This is very near and dear to Jewish hearts today. right? Since 1948, when the, the nation of Israel was founded, there has always been a, a passion at the core of the Jewish psyche and the Jewish mentality to have our own land, our own strip our own place, and even though you and I today might look on the news and regard, you know, Israel as a place that you might not want to spend a lot of time, there's war, it's war-torn, and there's massive hostility and conflict there, for, for Israel, and even Palestine to a degree, for a people to have their own land, to say, this is ours, there are people in this room, I'm looking at Blair and Emma, Sam and Katie, who are about ready to get their first house, is that right, Blair? 
It's your house. It belongs to you. It's, it's my house. Many of you in this room, if you own a house, it's yours. You have a sense of ownership, and it's a place where you can go, and there are well-defined boundaries, and you don't have a landlord. You own it. Probably, in, in most cases, the bank owns a lot of it. But still, you have the keys to the, you have the, keys to the door. That's the point. Right? So there's always been this idea that, that you would have something that was yours. It belonged to you. Okay, That was a big part of, of the Jewish mentality, that they would have their own place and their own land. Check this out. All the way back in the book of Deuteronomy, going back to the Old Testament, Moses says, when you go over the Jordan River and you live in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, it'll be your land. It'll be your nation. It'll be your country. You're going to own it. Well, what was the real attraction of having your own land and having your own place and having your own territory? Well, here it is. He will give you, what's that next word there? He will give you rest. He will give you rest from all your enemies round about so that you can live in safety. You'll have your own place and and you won't be surrounded only by, by all these hostile tribes and hostile nations. You will have rest. Of course, the modern nation of Israel is experiencing nothing like rest, right? But the ancient promise to ancient Israel was, oh, you'll have your own place, and you'll have land, and you will rest. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 19, notice here again, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all of your enemies round about in the land which the Lord your God gives you for an inheritance to possess, you will not forget. The promise was a promise of rest, and That's in Deuteronomy. That's before the time of Joshua. Moses wrote that. The baton is now placed into the hand of Joshua, and Joshua actually did that. In the sixth book of the Bible, it describes the the Israelites going into the land and receiving the land. We had a great sermon on this about a year ago uh, today uh, on the, the Israelites going into the Canaan land. Look at this, Joshua chapter 21, right down there to the end of the book. And the Lord gave them, what did he give them? He gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. He kept his promise. He said, you're going to have your own land, you're going to have your own place, and you will have rest. Hopefully now you can begin to see the pregnancy and the significance with which Jesus is speaking when Jesus has the audacity. I've said audacity several times here. It was audacious. It was ridiculous. It was absurd for a 20-something-year-old rabbi to be able to say to the religious establishment of his day, a strong, robust, opinionated, stubborn Jewish religious culture to say to them, come to me, come to me, and I will give you, what did he say he would give them? But not just bodily rest. He said, I will give you rest for your souls. So you would have been well within your historical rights if you were sort of a bystander to Jesus. You know, you're just sort of checking him out. He's going from town to town, place to place. If you would have just been like, who does this, who does this guy think he is? He carries himself like he's Moses. He, he's now carrying himself like he's Joshua. Does he think he's going to give rest? The promise of rest was a promise that was near and dear to the heart of Israel. The place of land, the place of rest, the place of reprieve, the place of peace from hostility that surrounded them. The rest that Jesus offers, of course, is not a rest from enemies that are external to us. Notice this. The real enemy is not people. But according to the Gospel of Matthew, the real enemy is sin. That's rebellion against God and death, which is the consequence of that rebellion. Every human being knows about both of these things. And Jesus brings rest from these. That's why he didn't say, I'll give you political rest, I'll give you national rest, I'll give you physical rest. He said, I will give you soulful rest. You will find rest for your souls. What an audacious promise, realistically. What a a ridiculous thing to say, unless, of course, it was true. Well, what follows immediately after Jesus' promise of rest are two significant events that revolve around the Sabbath. Okay, Jesus is confronted, and one of the sticking points in first century Judaism with Jesus was his treatment of the Sabbath, his keeping of the Sabbath, his disciples' keeping of the Sabbath, and he was regarded both by bystanders, but especially by the religious leaders of his day of playing fast and loose with the Sabbath. He was liberal with the Sabbath, and he wasn't strict with the Sabbath, and he wasn't textual or biblical with the Sabbath, and so you get the sense that this this conflict is coming. 
A conflict over the Sabbath is coming, and we, we, we encounter it in Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. We'll read the first two verses here. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. Jesus had just finished promising rest. Now we're going to talk about the Sabbath. Matthew is very purposeful, very intentional, very organized in his presentation of Jesus and his ministry. He's walking through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry. And they began to pluck the heads of grain and to eat. Right, I remember as a boy, I grew up uh, in Wyoming, and my grandfather had a large farm that was just over the border in Nebraska, and we would go visit his farm regularly as, as a child, and when the wheat was getting ready for harvest, we'd go down there, and we'd pick the heads of wheat, and you'd get a head of wheat in your hand, and you'd just go like that, and all, it would basically pull the kernel of wheat out of the chaff, and you'd just, whew, you'd just blow the chaff away and throw that sweet, soft wheat into your mouth. We'd, just, we'd spend a better part of an afternoon until our stomachs felt sick. Eating the wheat. That's what the disciples are doing. They're just walking through the edge of a field and, and they're gleaning. They're grabbing the little heads of wheat and they're, whoosh. but the Pharisees see it. Look, they say. Look what your disciples are doing. Verse 2. And they said to, to, the Pharisees said to him, the religious leaders of his day, look. Hey, maybe you hadn't noticed Jesus. Maybe it had escaped your attention that your understudies, your students, your disciples are doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. This is a very important story. Jesus here is being accused. Now, it's fascinating. Jesus himself is actually not accused. They don't say, you are eating. Jesus apparently was not eating, but he was allowing his disciples to eat. They're just plucking grain, right? Not, they don't have the combine out. They're not, they don't have the ox out. They don't have the horse out. They're not plowing the field. They're just grabbing some grain, scraping, uh, you know, rubbing it in their hands, blowing away the chaff, and eating the grain. And, and the Pharisees there, you get the real sense that they're on the lookout. They're on the prowl. They're looking for something with which to accuse this provocative young upstart. And so they say, hey, look, what about your disciples? They're breaking the law of Moses. Jesus gives three responses. And Jesus' responses are a master class in both conflict resolution and in textual ar argumentation. Now check this out. Jesus said to them, have you never read? Now let me just pause right there and say that that is quite an insult to people who regard themselves as experts in Scripture. What an audacious thing. I mean, who is this guy? He carries himself like this. I mean, he's 28, he's 29, maybe he's as old as 30. And he's speaking to people who would have been his senior in religious education, who would have been his senior in age, who would have been his senior in, in uh, standard, uh, standing within the religious community. And he says, have you not read? He's going to say that again. Look at verse 5. Have you not read? Look at verse 7. If you had known... It is a significant rebuke to call into question the conversancy and the literacy of religious people in their own religious text. He cites three instances. The first thing he tells is the story of David. We're going to come to that in a second. The second thing he tells is the story of the priests in the Old Testament who profane the Sabbath. And the third thing he does is he quotes from a book called Hosea. Let's just go through them because they are fascinating. Have you never read what David did when he was hungry and those that were with him, how he entered the house of God? That is to say the sanctuary, Moses' sanctuary, the, the sanctuary that Moses had built. The temple has not yet been built at this point. And uh, he ate the showbread that was not lawful. The Pharisees had said, hey, your disciples are doing what is not lawful. And Jesus is like, well, what about David? He did something that was not lawful. It was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Hey, don't you know that story? Don't you know your own religious text? Don't you know your own religious book? Don't you remember that story? Well, there's something very interesting here, fascinating. Jesus is not playing fast and loose with the Sabbath. He's not saying, oh, it doesn't really matter what you do on the Sabbath. What he says is amazing. He says, hey, don't you remember that story, that story from your own book? Let me remind you of the story. It's found in the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 21. Now, let's remind ourselves of who David is. At this point... In the story, David is fleeing from Saul. What's the guy's name that he's fleeing from? Saul. David has already been anointed as the king. You might remember that story. Right? Samuel the prophet shows up and he says to David's father, Hey, look, uh, one of your sons, God has shown me in a vision, one of your sons is going to be the king. And so he brings out the firstborn. Samuel's like, nah, 
it's not him. Brings out the second, brings out the third, brings out the fourth, brings out all the sons. And Samuel's like, I, these don't look like any of the guys that I saw in my vision. And then the dad incredulously says, well, I, I do have a youngest boy, but he's, he's of no real significance. He's just out taking care of the sheep. And Samuel's like, call him, bring that guy in. So they bring in young shepherd boy David. And when Samuel sees David, he's like, this is the one. Yeah, this is the one that I saw. And check this out. David was anointed as king. Follow this carefully. He was not enthroned as king. He was anointed as king by Samuel on that very day. When it came time for him to receive the kingdom, Saul, who was the king that was in, in the position of the king, would not give it, or the throne, he would not give it to David. So there was this dispute about David's royal claim. David believed he was the king. Samuel believed he was the king. God knew he was the king, but his royal claim was not recognized by the religious leaders of his day. Or actually was recognized by the religious leaders of his day, and that's the key. When David comes fleeing, and he comes to the sanctuary, he, he finds a priest there. The priest's name is Ahimelech. doesn't matter what his name is, but his name is Ahimelech. And David goes up to the temple, and he's like, hey, I'm fleeing from my life. Saul's trying to kill me. I'm super hungry. Do you have any food? And the priest is like, man, the refrigerator's totally bare, but we do have the show bread, but that's the, that's the holy bread. That's the temple bread, and only the priests are allowed to eat that. And David's like, please give me the bread. I need that bread. And the priest is like, all right, here's the bread. Okay, now here's a really cool thing. Check this out. David was anointed, but not enthroned. He was the rightful king. If that makes sense, say amen. That's the, that's the historical story that Jesus is quoting from here. The priest's assistance of David. Hey, I'm really hungry. Well, there's nothing in the fridge. Take the royal bread. Or excuse me, the, the holy bread. Take the priestly bread. The priest's assistant revealed his support of David and of his royal claim. Jesus doesn't just cherry pick some story out of the Old Testament. Think about Jesus' own situation. Has Jesus been anointed at this point? In the Gospel of Matthew, has Jesus yet been anointed? Yeah, he was baptized like in chapter 3. He was baptized nine chapters ago. So he's already been anointed. He has presented himself as Israel's king, but his royal claim is under dispute. And what Jesus is saying is remarkable. He's saying, if you really understood what was happening in front of you right now, there is already an anointing. The true king is standing before you. And the religious leaders of ancient times, in David's time, they understood when the true and anointed king was in front of them. And they weren't antagonistic to David. They supported David. What are you doing? That's the first point that he says. First point. Haven't you read? Haven't you read what David did? How he did that unlawful thing? Notice the next one here. Verse 5 it says, Or have you not read? Again, the, the, the subtlety and the nuance of these insults. Jesus is not being, he's not being pugilistic here. He's not being purposefully argumentative. But they have challenged him on lawfulness. And so he's asking them, well, what about your own text? Have you not read, and now he quotes from the book of Numbers, how on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath, but they are blameless. The priestly duties continued on the Sabbath. Right? All of the priestly duties, whether it was the sacrifice of animals or the going into the holy place, all of those duties continued on the Sabbath. And Jesus is like, hey, what about in your own book where the priests worked, the priests worked, but they were blameless. Jesus here is saying, there's a priest in your midst who is working. He is blameless. Not only is there a king in your midst that you're missing, there is a priest in your midst who is working and you're missing it. Verse 7, yet I say to you, in this place, there is one greater than the temple. That'll be the first of three greater than statements. We'll see them as we go through the text. Greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Jesus says they've committed no sin. They've committed no crime. The picking of a few uh, bits of, of wheat and, and you know, rolling them in their hands, they're, they're guiltless. But if you knew what your own Bible said, Hosea chapter 6, I desire mercy. God says, I want mercy, not sacrifice. I'm not impressed by your devotion. I'm not impressed by all these austere things you do. Just treat one another well. 
That's what I'm impressed with, God says. Now, here's a fascinating thing. When Jesus gives these three answers, the story of David is found in 1 Samuel. The priest profaning the temple is found in Leviticus. And Hosea is a prophet. The Jewish division of the Old Testament was a threefold division. The law, the prophets, and the writings. The writings were the Psalms and the Ecclesiastes and that kind of thing. So the threefold division, even today, if you ask Jews about the division of the Old Testament, they'll say the law, that's the writings of Moses, the prophets, and the writings. Did you know that, notice that Jesus has carefully chosen a story from the law and the prophets and the writings? Jesus has said, it, in, in a master stroke of addressing the, the concern that they have, he has said, look, the text of Scripture is on my side, not yours. A king is in your midst. A priest is in your midst. And what God is really interested in is not these austere rules that you make, but in just treating one another with mercy and with kindness and with humility. What a beautiful story. Now, Jesus then excuses himself from there. Verse 8, he says, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Which is, again, an audacious claim. I am the Lord of of the Sabbath. I decide what is appropriate and inappropriate on the Sabbath. I decide what is lawful and unlawful on the Sabbath. Then we come to the second of two instances that revolve around the Sabbath, picking it up in verse 9. Now, when he had departed from there, so they leave the grain fields, right? The Pharisees are standing there going, right? Because he's just given them the law and the prophets and the writings and shown them that their accusation was unfounded. So now he makes his way to a synagogue. When he went into the synagogue, there was a man there who had a withered hand. So there's this guy there in the synagogue with a withered hand, a palsied hand. And they asked him, hey, since we're talking about the Sabbath, and since you've promised to give everybody rest, is it lawful? There's that word lawful. Your disciples do what is not lawful. David did what is not lawful. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? This was actually a fascinating rabbinical question in the days of Jesus. And there were all of these very fastidious first century rules about what was appropriate and not appropriate. Okay, in first century, there was different rabbinical schools. And some rabbis said no healing on the Sabbath is appropriate. And others said no, you can administer medication on the Sabbath as long as the medication was mixed and prepared before the Sabbath. You know, all of these little, no, that's okay, but that's not okay. That's okay, but that's not okay. So they want to see where does Jesus come down in this debate? Is it okay to heal on the Sabbath? Look at this man, he has a palsied hand. Would it be okay to administer an ointment or to put some sort of a poultice? Or would it be okay to, to heal on the Sabbath? Is that lawful? So right at this point, we're just going to press the briefest of pauses. And I want to point this out. The essence of the Sabbath and of the whole law is love and life. Can you say amen to that? The whole purpose of the law, the whole purpose of the Old Testament, the whole purpose of the Sabbath has as its rock bottom foundation, love, all the, all the laws fulfilled in one word, love and life. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to ask you a question, and it's a question that a surprising number of Seventh-day Adventists do not know the answer to, and I'm going to guess that you'll be just like most people. I want to ask you a question that would seem really obvious and really easy to Seventh-day Adventists, and many of you here today are Seventh-day Adventists, not all of you, of course, but many of you are. According to the Sabbath commandment, just how does one keep the Sabbath holy? I, I'm asking. Anybody want to give me an answer? How? Okay, remember. How do you remember it, Cara? Come on now. Don't be timid. Don't be Australian. How do you do it? Okay, you rest. Okay, rest. Okay, so you keep the Sabbath by resting. How do you keep it holy? Pray. According to the commandment. The commandment doesn't say to pray. The commandment doesn't say anything about worship. Go ahead, Jackie. Oh, yeah, Tony. I knew I was going to do that. Tony. I'm, the commandment. I want the commandment. According to the commandment. According to Exodus chapter 20, Deuteronomy chapter 5, I want to know how to keep the Sabbath, you crazy Seventh-day Adventist people. You, by the way, you've given an answer. That's a correct answer. That's the only correct answer so far is to rest. Anybody else? Okay, we already got that base covered, Trevor. We're going to rest in God. What, what is that? What is that? 
Okay, John, no, we're getting somewhere now. Let's go read the commandment. Let's just read it. Let's remind ourselves of this important commandment, the fourth and the tenth. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Check. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Yep, check. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Check, got it, yep. In it you shall do no work. Ah, here we're getting to the practical. Okay, how do I keep it holy? How do I keep the Sabbath holy? In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger who is within your gates. Okay, got it? Four and six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. That's the commandment. Now, the first thing I want you to notice about this commandment is what's not there. You just read it. We just read it. What is not in the commandment? First of all, there is nothing about a ceremony in the Sabbath commandment. Nothing. Nothing about ceremony. There's nothing about worship in the commandment. No, the word is not there. There's no word about ceremony. Number two, there's no offerings, which is unusual because when you read the Old Testament, if, for example, on the day of Pas uh, the Passover or on the Feast of uh, Unleavened Bread, whatever, you had all these offerings and you bring it this day and this certain way, nothing about offerings. There's no ritual washings. No, you got to get cleaned and do all of this and bathe and stay away from women and all of that. There's nothing. There's nothing Jewish in the Sabbath. You just read it. What is distinctly Jewish in the Sabbath commandment? The answer? Nothing. Nothing. Which raises the question. How do you keep the Sabbath? And you and Jono gave the correct answer. According to the, according to the commandment, I'll tell you how to keep the Sabbath. Some of you might have wondered. Man, you've been, you've been a Seventh-day Adventist for maybe some of you for years, generationally. Didn't even know how to keep the Sabbath. Well, I'll tell you how to do it. It's real simple. You keep the Sabbath by resting. Check. By the way, that's not just a physical rest. It's a soulful rest. We'll probably spend a moment on that. And by giving others rest. According to the commandment, that's how you do it. You won't work nor your stranger, nor the servant in the household, not the male, not the female, not the son, not the daughter, not even your cow, not even your horse will work on the Sabbath. So you will rest. The stranger that's staying with you, the non-Jewish stranger that's staying with you, they will not work either. You will rest, and all of those over whom you have control and influence, you will give them rest. Well, this sounds fascinating. This is what we just heard Jesus saying at the end of Matthew chapter 11. Come to me and I will give you rest. I will Sabbath you. You keep the Sabbath, friends, not by coming to church. I have no problem with you being in church. I think it's a great place to be. I think it's good to come and sing some songs. And that's, but there's nothing in the Sabbath commandment about being here. And dressing up and wearing your bow tie or not. Nothing about that. According to the Sabbath commandment, you keep the Sabbath by resting and giving rest. Why don't we say that together? We keep the Sabbath by resting and giving rest. Okay, that's how we do it. That's how we keep the Sabbath. And this is exactly what Jesus did. He gave rest. He offered the Sabbath, not just the literal seventh-day Sabbath. He offered a soulful rest to those that were around him. Now, because of this, there are a number of things that we can be absolutely certain are appropriate and not appropriate on a Sabbath. It's just so simple. First of all, you are resting from your normal labors. So whatever your personal occupation is, right, whether you're a plumber or an electrician or you're a, a, a rancher or a farmer or a, a David told us a story about how his a dad was a, had, a, owned a dairy. Whatever your normal occupation is, on Sabbath, you rest from that. Okay? That's, how, that's what you do. You rest from it. It doesn't mean that you stay in bed all day. It means that you rest. It literally means just to cease from your labors. It doesn't mean to lay in bed all day. So you cease from that part. But here's the other part you then extend restfulness to others. You follow that? Which would mean that not only are you not working, the normal work that you would do on the day in the course of your, your career, you do not cause others to work. If you were refraining from work, but you were causing others to work, well, that's not keeping Sabbath. 
right? So you couldn't, you couldn't be like, oh, man, church is done. Let's go get a coffee. Let's go down. Let's get some breakfast. Let's go sit down at a local restaurant. That, that's not keeping Sabbath. That's just going to church. There's a big difference between going to church and keeping Sabbath. Keeping Sabbath and entering into the rest that Jesus has provided is resting yourself, ceasing and desisting from the labors and occupations that, that, that keep most of your time, and then extending that to others, not allowing others to work on your behalf, the stranger that is in your gates. So the idea that you could go and spend money on the Sabbath or that you could go to a restaurant on the Sabbath or that you could do the, all of these and you, and you could still be keeping the Sabbath is absurd. Now, I'm a person who is not, I don't like to be black and white where life is gray, but I don't like to be gray where life is black and white either, right? And I can be flexible on certain issues where you can say, well, it could be like that, oh, it could be like that, it could be a little bit like this, it could be a little bit like that. I can be flexible, Right? But where Scripture is not flexible, I don't have the prerogative to be flexible. And Scripture is as clear as the noonday sun, that we keep Sabbath by resting and by giving rest, by resting ourselves and by extending rest to others. And so if you're here today as a Sabbath keeper, let me let you know something. There's a big difference between going to church and keeping Sabbath. If you leave church and go to a place or you, come to, you go to that place before you come to church where you are doing something, anything that requires others to work on your behalf, whether it's get you a meal or check you out at the check, check stand or whatever it is, you are not keeping Sabbath. You're just going to church. And there's a big difference between keeping Sabbath the way that God intended it, the passion that he has to rest and to give rest. There's a big difference between that and then just sitting in a pew on Saturday morning. Now, this gets really, really awesome. Check this out. Jesus then says, Jesus answers this question about whether or not it's okay to heal on the Sabbath in a really provocative way. Verse 11, then he said to them, well, what man is there among you? Hey, I'm asking you guys. What man is there among you that if he has a sheep that falls into a pit on the Sabbath, won't lay hold of the sheep and lift it out? They always, well, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, my sheep, yeah, I, I do that. And then he says, of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. It is lawful to do, it's not lawful to spend money on the Sabbath. It's not lawful to go out to eat at a restaurant on Sabbath. It's not lawful to order something on the Sabbath. It's not lawful to drop into the coffee shop and pick yourself up a coffee. Not that you should be doing that anyway. It's, those things are not lawful. But it is lawful to be a blessing. It is lawful to help people. That is full well. And then Jesus, this is fascinating. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And I love this because Jesus purposefully, there's a real subtlety here. There's a real nuance here where Jesus has carefully navigated the rabbinical debates of his day because Jesus is not laying hands on the man to perform an act of healing. He simply asks the man to stretch out his hand, which was no violation of Sabbath. He just says to the man, stretch out your hand. And when the man stretches out his hand, check this out. As he stretched it out, it was restored as whole as the other. And I love this, verse 14. And the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. Matthew wants you to know that Jesus has been dwelling under the shadow of the cross from chapter 1. There are people who are plotting not just the death of Jesus, but the full destruction, that is to say, of his influence, of his reputation, and of, of his significance. They want, they want Jesus gone. He is a threat to them. He's a threat to the establishment. Jesus is the consummate revolutionary. And they don't like it. They're made uncomfortable by it. The Sadducean aristocracy, as well as the conservative Pharisees, they do not like Jesus. And so they leave. He's, trumped, he's, he's, he's stumped them now twice. He stumped them in the grain fields about whether or not the disciples were breaking Sabbath. And he stumped them now with this man who's been made whole. What did Jesus just do? He gave this man rest from his pain, rest from his suffering, rest from his disease. This man would have found a soul rest. I love this. I invented a word. I hope you don't mind. Jesus emphasized both the lawfulness and the lifefulness of the Sabbath. Jesus is giving life. He's giving hope. He's giving redemption. Jesus is not sitting in a coffee shop on Sabbath afternoon chilling with his friends. He's not going out to eat because he was too lazy to have prepared a meal beforehand. 
Jesus is emphasizing the lawfulness and the lifefulness of Sabbath. Helping, ministering, healing, restoring, encouraging. That is keeping Sabbath. Resting and giving rest. Not I'm resting, here I am, Seventh-day Adventist, remnant, keeping the Sabbath. I'll have that, please, without cheese. (laughs) Keeping Sabbath. Now go wait on me. Go serve me. Clean my dishes. Come to my table. I'm keeping Sabbath. My servants, my strangers within my gate. You're not keeping Sabbath. I don't know what you're doing, but you're not keeping Sabbath. You might have gone to church. You're not keeping Sabbath. Jesus rested, and he gave rest. I know that there are people within the cultural confines of Adventism who have become accustomed to these little, what they regard as gray areas. These are not gray areas. This is Sabbath breaking, my friends. Straight up. Straight up. Now check this out. In his marvelous book, and I think there are two books that should be in your library. These books... These books should be in your library. I'm pleading with you. Look at this book. It's just beat to tar because I've read it so many times. The Lost Meaning of the Seventh Day by Sigve Tonstad is the modern classic on the Sabbath. You need this book. Am I right, Blair? You need this book. It needs to be in your library. And I know this is going to come as a surprise to some of you. You need to read it. (laughs) Oh, yeah, I got that book. There it is. It's in my library. It's in my library. And uh, some of you don't like reading very much. I'll give you a smaller book. This is the smaller book, harder to read, actually. This one's called The Sabbath by Abraham Joshua Heschel. These two books, The Sabbath and The Lost Meaning of the Seventh Day, belong in your library, and I recommend them to you without reservation. Notice what Tonstead says in The Lost Meaning of the Seventh Day. The seventh day, this idea of the Sabbath, must be seen as the launching pad for the most exceptional and ambitious project of social justice in the ancient world. Are you kidding, Tonstead? This is the most ambitious social justice project in the ancient world. How so? How is the Sabbath about social justice and about freedom and about freedom from exploitation? Look at this. The freedom from work and from the yoke of exploitation, he continues, are explicit characteristics of the Sabbath. Exodus chapter 20, verse 10. When the circle is drawn, the Sabbath circle, nothing and nobody lies outside its domain. Not even the barista at your local coffee shop. Right. By the way, I don't recommend you drink coffee either, but that's another little charming sin that we'll deal with it sometime in the future. The particulars on this list are amazing because, watch this, no parallels have been found in other cultures. There are no parallels for the Sabbath in other cultures. This idea that you set aside a time, you set that full side of time, uh, that full time aside, and you rest in it. Legislation of this kind, says Tonstead, in the ancient world prioritizes from the bottom up, not from the top looking down, giving first consideration to the weakest and most vulnerable members of society, like a man with a shriveled hand. The Sabbath prioritizes the weak, it prioritizes the exploited, it it prioritizes the vulnerable, it prioritizes the underprivileged, it prioritizes the needy. The Sabbath even prioritizes animals. Look at this. Those who need rest the most, the slave, the resident alien, the beast of burden, are singled out for special mention in the rest of the, of the seventh day. The underprivileged and even mute animals find an ally. Friends, when we go out and cause people to work for us in various capacities on the Sabbath, I don't even fly on Sabbath. I don't travel on Sabbath. I don't spend money on Sabbath. I'm just not doing that because I don't want to treat people worse than God tells me to treat animals. I don't want to treat a human being worse than God tells me to treat an animal. I need rest. And you might say, well, they're not keeping Sabbath. They don't know about the Sabbath. Well, true enough, there's lots of people that don't know about adultery, lots of people that don't know about killing, lots of people that don't know about God's name in vain. But but don't expect me as a Bible believer and as somebody who loves God to create situations for others to break what I value. Now, I really don't steal. But if you could get me that, if you'd steal that, I'd give, you a, I'd give you some money for it. I personally wouldn't sleep with a woman other than my wife, but I'll watch you on a pornographic channel sleep with somebody that's not your wife. Is that, is that how it works? Is that, is that our standard of ethics? As long as you're not doing it, you can give others opportunity and occasion to do it, and then you can enjoy it. No. No, no. 
The beauty of the, the whole law is that it's valuing others. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. That's what it's about. And then to love your neighbor as yourself. To rest and give rest. To rest and give rest. There's nothing about going to church. I don't mind you being in church. I'm happy for you to be here. It gives me somebody to talk to. But it's far more important to me that you keep Sabbath. And it's far more important to God that you rest and give rest. That you rest and give rest. All right. You guys have been great. I told you I'd say a lot about a little, and I've done that. I've been, I've been faithful to what I said. The Sabbath rest teaches Samuel Bakioki's excellent book, Divine Rest for Human Restlessness. I love this. The Sabbath rest teaches the greedy heart to be grateful. To stop for one day looking for more and to start instead to gratefully acknowledge the blessings already received. As the rest of Matthew chapter 12 unfolds, we find Jesus in conflict. And N.T. Wright summarizes this perfectly. He says, here is Jesus. This is Matthew chapter 12 verse 15. Here is Jesus surrounded by pressure on all sides. His own followers don't really understand what he's doing. People are badgering him from every direction to heal them, to cast out spirits, for, uh, to, be, uh, to be there for them in every need. At the same time, opposition is growing. Herod, the so-called king of the Jews, is not far away. Religious pressure groups are stirring up trouble. Some are even saying he's in league with the devil. That happens later in, Acts, uh, in Matthew chapter 12. He knows where this is all leading, and he still goes on. He goes on because Jesus has a story in mind. And the story that Jesus has in mind, as you read through the rest of Matthew chapter 12, which we're not going to have time to go into today, and this was by calculation. He tells the story of the servant, the suffering servant of Isaiah chapter 42. This servant, in fact, I'll read you the description of it. I love this. Behold my servant, I'm in verse 18, whom I have chosen. Look at my servant. In whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him. He will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel. Nor cry. Jesus did not love argumentation. In fact, verse 15 says that after these two conflicts, Jesus withdrew. He was not somebody that loved to tell people off. He wasn't somebody that had got a special pleasure out of confrontation. He hated confrontation. He withdrew from it. And here it says, he will not quarrel. He wasn't an argumentative jerk. No, he, he, he just wanted to spend time with people. He wanted to be in the company of people. And he wanted to help them. He wanted to rest and especially extend rest. He will not quarrel. A bruised reed he will not break. He's so gentle. A smoking flax he will not quench. So gentle. Till he sends justice to victory. And in his name the Gentiles will trust. The whole world will hope upon his name. Jesus then gets into a conflict about the casting out of demons, which is fascinating. He tells a story about binding a strong man, binding him up, and then going and spoiling his house. But I want to jump down to our last bit here. It's verses 41 and 42. The last bit, jump all the way down to 41 and 42. He says a tree will be known by its fruity. Important stuff in here. But here are the next two of the greater than statements. Verse 41 says, The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment against this generation and condemn it, because they did not repent at the preaching, or they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Verse 42, the queen of the south will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. Three times Jesus has, in this chapter, had the audacity to say, a greater than the temple, a greater than Jonah, and a greater than Solomon. <laughs> what? Let's just walk through those. I'm greater than the temple. Greater than the priests that minister in the temple. Greater than everything that's associated with the temple. The whole Jewish economy. There is one that is greater here than that. Who says this kind of thing? You could only say this if you were totally insane or you were who you, who you claim to be. Truly God. Who says that kind of thing? The next thing he says is one greater than Jonah. Jonah. Jonah was probably the single most successful prophet in the entire Old Testament. He, he went to a city, preached for like a day, and the whole city repented. Nobody else had that kind of success. And he's like, a greater than Jonah is here. 
And Solomon was the greatest king in all of ancient Israel in terms of material prosperity. And Jesus had the temerity to say that a greater than Solomon is here. I'm greater than the greatest priest. I'm greater than the greatest prophet. And I'm greater than the greatest king. This guy is either on a total ego trip or he is who he claims to be, the Lord of the Sabbath and the Lord full stop. The Sabbath is the rest of the story. It's the rest of the story. God offers this to us. I want to close with this. I came up with this just this week. I hope you like it. The Sabbath is a place where God's story and our story come together. Every week we keep Sabbath. It's a place where God's story, the story that God is doing in the world, his story of creation, his story of redemption, becomes a part of your story, your weekly story. I know you're busy. I know you've got work to do. I know it's hard to put the emails and all that on stop, and I, I get all that. It's hard for me, too. But the Sabbath is a place where our story comes into synchronicity with God's story. Every week. Every week. I like to say it this way. We don't keep the Sabbath so much as it keeps us. This is a total paradigm change for some of you. It's not that you're keeping the Sabbath, friends. If you truly are living the Sabbath life that Jesus offers, the Sabbath is keeping you. You might be saying, my son said just this morning, he's like, what do you mean the Sabbath keeps me? Well, let me give you just a few. Well, the Sabbath keeps you aware of God and of his creation, which, by the way, puts you ahead of much of the world today. Just an awareness. Hey, there's a really big God out there, and this world does not belong to me, and I can't just exploit it environmentally and criminally that, 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 and, and socially. That, that I'm not the center of the universe. Keeps me aware of that. The Sabbath keeps you aware of Christ and of his rest. Of not only resting yourself, but of receiving the rest that Jesus gives. The Sabbath keeps you from worldliness. Because it teaches you every single week that this world is not your ultimate destination. That God has a bigger, grander, better plan. The Sabbath keeps you from insatiable materialism. More, brighter, fancier, better. The 2016 model. No, I need the 2017 model. No, I need the 2018 model. I need more. I need more. Consumerism has now been identified as a worldview. The Sabbath keeps you from unquenchable consumerism. Right? Consumerism is the new communism. It's a worldview. It's a way of doing life. Consuming more me and those of us that live in first world countries like America and uh, Australia and England and Canada and other first world countries, we live like kings. Kings and queens. If there are more than three pairs of shoes in your closet, you're living like a king. You're living like a queen, right? And we just think all of those people in China, all of those people in Taiwan, all of those people work for me so I can buy $10 shirts. I'm telling you, man, you live like a king. We live like queens. And I want to, this consumerism cannot slake spiritual thirst. You are not made just to buy more stuff. Not the men with your toys and not the ladies with our dresses and clothes and little bits and pieces. You were made to worship, to love, to assist, to rest, and to give rest. The Sabbath keeps you from unquenchable consumerism. The Sabbath keeps you focused on what really matters. That's what Heschel's book is about. The Sabbath keeps you from self-centered isolationism. Me, me, me. The Sabbath keeps you aware that there's a world around you that has needs to. The Sabbath keeps you aware that life is more than work. Thank Jesus for the Sabbath. In an age of rampant consumerism, rampant materialism, and rampant workaholicism, we need the Sabbath. The Sabbath keeps us looking forward to Friday night, and not for the reasons that most people look forward to Friday night. Amen. The Sabbath keeps you humble, it keeps you kind, and it keeps you socially, environmentally, fiscally responsible. And finally, the Sabbath keeps you from being lost in a crazy world. It gives you a sense of place. It gives you a sense of story. It gives you a sense of narrative. My invitation to you is don't just go to church. Don't just go to church on Saturday and think you're keeping Sabbath. No. No. You can be in church and not be keeping Sabbath. And you can be keeping Sabbath and not be in church. My invitation to you is to keep the Sabbath that Jesus intended. Don't keep the Sabbath. Let the Sabbath keep you. Final slide. You made it. You survived. Start 
keeping the Sabbath by letting it keep you. To truly, meaningfully, and genuinely enter into the rest that Jesus offers, which is a rest not just for your body, your beleaguered body because you're working too hard to support a lifestyle that you don't really need. That's the case of too many in here. To enter into the purpose that God created you for, to love and be loved, to rest, to give re- to rest and give rest, and to be God's son and God's daughter. Father in heaven, many of us, myself included, have been keeping Sabbath without keeping Sabbath. And Father, I pray that we would let the Sabbath rest wash over us and we would have a paradigm shift on what it means to keep Sabbath. To truly enter into the soulful rest that Jesus promises. That we might be the best versions of ourselves and that we might make the world around us a little better. Whether it's just our own family or our own social circle or our co-workers. Father, teach us how to not get caught up in the hustle and bustle and rat race of this world gone mad and to come apart and rest a while to receive the rest, the Sabbath rest that Jesus offers. And Father, as we receive that rest, help us to imbibe it into our inmost soul, to drink it in, to live it, to absorb the restfulness that only you can offer. A rest from sin, a rest from guilt, a rest from pain, a rest from suffering. And then, Father, as we receive that rest... To then extend that rest to others. The opportunity to introduce others to Jesus. To not be letting them work for us. Serving us in our little Seventh-day Adventist kingdom. Father, help us to extend rest to the world around us. Help us truly. Not just to believe the Sabbath. But to be kept by it. And the God of the Sabbath. Jesus himself said, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is our Lord. He is our King. Help us to receive the rest that he promises and then to extend it to those around us is my prayer in Jesus' name. Let all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. And happy Sabbath. Hey, greetings from beautiful and sunny Kingscliff, Australia. I want to take just a moment of your time, first of all, to thank you for tuning in, watching the program. I trust it was a blessing to you and your soul, drawing you closer to God and His will for your life. I also want to let you know that we are planning a significant expansion of our existing media ministry here at the Kingscliff Church. To find out more about this expansion and how you can get involved, go to bringitkingscliff.com. You can go either to the homepage or to the Our Gifts page to find out how you can come alongside us and support, not just with your viewership, but also financially and with your prayers. Hey, thanks again so much for watching and take care.